Innate helps companies avoid project surprises, make better informed decisions, share knowledge, and deliver better outcomes. Innate, transforming the way the world builds. Hello, project people. Welcome back to a brand new episode of the Project Chatter podcast. It's always good to have you with us. And this is a special episode because I'm joined by a very special co-host, Joseph Belouz. How are you, sir? I'm good. Val, how are you? I'm very, very good. It's great to have you because you have the knowledge and the local knowledge. And I think Chris will probably be asking you questions as well. Um, But let's bring our guest in today. Uh, Chris Bruntland, how are you, sir? I'm doing well, yeah. Good morning. Uh, Well, good evening for you folks. Uh, We are, uh, what? uh tens time zones away so uh, where are you at the moment i am uh at the home office in in delft in the netherlands so we're right beautiful between uh, rotterdam and the hague i've got some great memories there before we get into it though man i think we have to we have to find the origin story because sometimes how we end up where we end up is such an interesting and fascinating story for the listeners but how did you get into bikes and how did you end up over there yeah, it's a, it is a, a bizarre, interesting story um, to my current position, which is uh, marketing and communication manager at the Dutch Cycling Embassy, uh, which is a, an arm of the national government here in the Netherlands. Uh, and I am not Dutch, uh, as you can probably tell from my name and my accent, um, but uh, originally from Vancouver, Canada, and spent uh, many, many years there working in cycling promotion, cycling. Uh, advocacy, uh, um, but did not study anything to do with transportation. It was uh, a passion project that I was doing on the evenings and weekends with my wife, Melissa. Uh, and uh, it just kind of snowballed into forming our own consultancy in 2014, writing a book in 2018 that was published by Island Press called Building the Cycling City, the Dutch Blueprint for Urban Vitality. Took us on a global speaking tour uh, across America, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, including stops in uh, Sydney, Canberra, uh, Melbourne, and Perth, and uh, ultimately caught the attention of the Dutch Cycling Embassy, who uh, made me an offer I couldn't refuse and and, uh, brought our family to uh, Delft in the Netherlands in 2019, and for the last four years, have been happily living and working uh, the quote-unquote Dutch dream. That is that is an incredible story, and and amazing too to be um, doing something you love. I mean, I, I always I'm always ad, admire people who have found their passion. But what was it about bikes? Was it the sustainability point of view? Was it the the pleasure of riding? Was it was it changing or shaping cities? What was it that really got you out of bed? Yeah, I think it was all of the above, uh, really, uh, through uh, a series of decisions, I ended up, uh, well, our, our family ended up selling our car in 2010, because we just weren't using it. We had, Melissa and I were working close to home, we had everything we needed in a 10 or 15 minute walk or cycle ride. And uh, we were just spending more time on our bikes, we were spending more time with our kids, uh, riding our bikes together. Uh, and that uh, it just grew into uh, a passion, trying to communicate and share the joys of cycling uh, in a city that that prioritizes it and creates space for cycling. Uh, raising a family, you know, uh, it, it's it's uh, well saved us a lot of money, allowed us to keep continue living in an increasingly expensive city. Um, and uh, really, yeah, we just wanted to share that that happiness and it it started with social media uh instagram twitter uh and uh, so on and uh evolved into blog posts and and uh video productions and um yeah i mean it was at the time when vancouver was uh investing heavily in cycling infrastructure we had a bike friendly mayor that was really putting his neck on the line because there was a lot of controversy and a lot of pushback but we like to think that we were this positive voice for change that kind of drove well, it didn't drive the conversation, but but shone a light on the real impact these decisions were having for families like us. Yeah, and it's almost a it's almost a common sense or logical point of view. You know, you see, and I've I've had the privilege of being in the Netherlands and and enjoying that space and and the way the culture is built around cycling uh, to and from work, but socially to get from A to B, the whole city is kind of shaped by that that way of of or that thoroughfare of, of travel. Uh, where you see as other big cities, you know, particularly in Australia, where we're from, 
uh, there is a challenge to kind of shape the city now that you've got the big infrastructure, heavy rail, et cetera, big buses, uh, trains, you know, tr uh, trucks as well. It, it becomes a bit of a challenge then to kind of move towards, um, you know, the, as you said, the Netherlands uh, utopia. How have you seen, in particular, maybe Vancouver, how have you seen them transform and what, where do they start from an investment perspective? Yeah, it really, I think with, with this topic, uh, with this area, it requires uh, a level of political leadership that's not seen absolutely everywhere. And in Vancouver's case, it was Gregor Robertson, a kind of young idealistic mayor that came on the scene with big plans to create uh, space recycling. He himself rode a bike, but he recognized he was just a minority because um, it was quite uncomfortable and unsafe. And so, um, you know, over the, the 12, plus years that we lived there. They went from one segregated cycle track to probably about a dozen uh, and, uh, you know, built out this grid, this network of, of uh, what they called all ages and abilities cycle routes uh, to make it possible, yeah, to ride with our five and eight year old children at the time um, without worrying about their safety or, or, or their comfort. And so, um, over that period of time, cycling in Vancouver went from about 5% of journeys to 10 to 12%. So it doubled uh, in about a decade. And, uh, but I think more importantly, the types of people cycling uh, changed immensely. It went from just the fit, brave uh, young men to uh, a much more diversity, much more women cycling, much more elderly people, children, uh, uh, because that, that, uh, yeah, that network uh, was in place. And so um it, it's proof that yeah if, with the right political leadership you can get the community on side you can get the business community on side uh and eventually you reach this tipping point where uh these reallocation of road space and this uh, removal of car parking becomes less and less controversial every time and that's what the netherlands has shown because they've been doing it longer than anybody yeah brilliant Jason. absolutely yeah, I just had one which i think i was going to circle back to now but i was um Funny, because you mentioned in your, I think in your book and one of your forwards, um, about the political courage, which you kind of forwarded on in terms of um, the importance of that and having that catalyst. Because in Sydney now we have that exact same thing with the Minister for Active Transport and we're seeing it happen across the board of just people sticking their neck out really to get this catalyst for change occurring. But my question was um, back, I guess, when you were in Vancouver, in terms of what was your city shaped? Because you said you started cycling about 2010, you said in terms of, you know, using it for your short trips. Do you also base it on not just infrastructure, but what's actually, you know, around within your 10, 20 minute uh, neighborhood to actually, is that a catalyst or is that part of what actually drives you to also cycle or ride around, not just having the infrastructure as well? Yeah, you, you really can't talk about transportation with talk, without talking about land use and you can't talk <laughs> about land use without talking about transportation. That's Melissa right. and I both, both grew up in suburban Canada uh, where everything was uh well it certainly wasn't in walking distance just to go get a, a a jug of milk you had to get in your car by default because it was so far um and so yeah building this mixed use uh, environment where you have your pharmacy your grocery store uh your schools uh, your public transportation all within a short distance this idea of a 15 minute city which is evolving uh and and catching momentum now mm. uh the can conditions required to make walking and cycling an option. But having said all of that, I think it's still quite surprising and quite astounding how many short car journeys take place even in suburban America or Canada or Australia. I mean, uh, I think the latest figures were half of all- More than half, yeah, in, in Sydney. It, uh, are under three kilometers and that's perfectly walkable or cyclable if we design and build the infrastructure to make that possible because right now, it's incredibly stressful. It's incredibly uncomfortable. And so people just pick the car by default just because that that decision is made for them by the design of the streets. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I agree. I mean, I'll, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Well, yeah, you go, Joseph. No, no, I agree. It's the same thing with you. Grew up in a suburban area where never thought of cycling around and now in a very dense, you know, um, very, I guess, equipped area where the car is also sitting in some street, not being used at all. Um, and the 15 minute neighborhood is a very interesting concept because it's a very key focus for us, but people are still trying to decipher it here in Sydney. So what do you kind of want to impart or what do you think, what do you think of that concept actually of the 15 minute neighborhood or the 15 minute city? Yeah, it's, it I mean, I you? think, 
it, I think it's a, a new name on an old idea. It's, uh, you know, mm. quite cleverly branded by uh, Carlos Mourinho, who's an advisor to Paris Mayor and Hidalgo during her mayoral campaign. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, yeah, this this 15 minute city is not a new concept. I think uh, there has been some research that shows 94 uh, percent of the Dutch population lives within a 15 minute bike ride of all of their daily needs, including a pharmacy, a grocery store and a school. So, uh, you know, it's it, it's certainly happening in places whatever name you want to put on it. Um, but it just it, it I think uh, when we talk about making our cities more accessible for children and the elderly and people with disabilities and uh, lower incomes. Uh, this is the first step we need to take to design car dependency out of our cities and, and make it possible for everybody to participate, not just the ones with the driver's license. Yeah, that makes sense. And, I, you know, we, we haven't talked about benefits, but I, I still think this is a no brainer when it comes to things like health, social economic benefits, environment, carbon uh, we haven't talked about that yet. Safety, access, precinct and land use design. I mean, there are so many things that that this pike, uh, this fifteen minute city idea or concept, which isn't new, as you said, Chris, could could help most cities because we've all got. I guess most governments now have targets to reduce carbon, to improve the livability of cities, to improve improve safety and health and the environment. Um, which one, in terms of benefits, are the priority when you come to interact with various <laughs> governments? I mean. They've got to yeah. put them in order. They can't do them all at once. Or do they try to do the big bang method? No, it really, I think that's one of the the hard parts about promoting cycling is there's so many different benefits uh, that it, it's hard to pick one and focus on it. I think um, having uh, just come out of the COP27 conference where the Dutch cycling embassy was present, uh, I think the the, the climate change is, is uh, probably top of mind for a lot of cities and governments around the world. And it's, becoming the driving factor uh, to uh, change their transportation systems because uh, they've figured out that they can't electrify every single car on the planet, at least not uh, overnight. It's going to take decades. It's going to take huge amounts of resources. Uh, and one of the, the quickest and cheapest things we can do is start uh, uh, switching people's travel behavior from the car to walking, cycling, and public transportation. It's incredibly uh, cost efficient, uh, and we can do it tomorrow uh, if we if we so choose. And so, um, yeah, I think this is, uh, climate change is becoming the defining you know, topic of our era, but that's not to say that all these other benefits aren't part of the conversation. We also uh, are experiencing an obesity crisis. Uh, there's also a lack of resilience in our city when it comes to well, we saw that with the uh, with the COVID pandemic, uh, streets were suddenly or cities were suddenly scrambling to create space for mm. cycling or outdoor dining areas, taking space away from cars uh, to help their businesses and help people move around uh, for fear that everybody was going to jump in their cars uh, and use it as a piece of personal protective equipment. Um, yeah. So, I mean, keep going. Uh, benefits to yeah. the local economy. <laughs> uh really more subtle and, and less uh, um, uh, documented benefits like mental health, like social cohesion and connectivity. There's a lot to be said about being outside in the elements, making face-to-face -face contact with your fellow citizens every day uh, and negotiating with them in traffic. You know, it does a lot to build social trust and, uh, and build a more cohesive society than us all being locked up in metal and glass boxes uh, in isolation. Uh, so, uh, yeah, entire books have been written on the topic, uh, and, uh, there's ob the obvious benefits. There's the not so obvious benefits, but there's really very few reasons why most cities in the world can't, uh, build more cycling into their, uh, their urban fabric. So it makes a good sense. And you definitely make a good business case in terms of the benefits to a government. If I'm already listening and I'm ready to ride my bike, Joseph, I don't know about you, but it does sound like there, other than riding. political kind of, <laughs> other than <laughs> political uh, sponsorship, I guess there is uh, still inhibitors that are stopping cities from shaping towards this kind of uh, this arrangement from a transport perspective. What is it that's stopping them from you, your understanding? Inertia. <laughs> I think uh, the status quo is a very uh, enticing thing because, uh, as we said earlier, this does require some political bravery. As soon as you start talking about taking a lane or two away from cars or taking a few parking spots away, mm. um, 
you're going to get a backlash. It's uh, there's going to be a controversy. Whether that controversy is actually representative of the community, I would say probably not. But all it takes, as we saw in Vancouver, is a few angry, well-connected uh, people who can get the attention of the media and get the attention of their politician friends uh, to make something seem uh, controversial within the community and and get that proposal immediately watered down or or cancelled. And we've seen it that taken to an extreme uh, in some cities. Uh, recently in Brussels, they implemented uh, a traffic circulation plan and the minister responsible was subject to death threats and now has to, uh, wow. you know, travel around the city with a security detail. So um, when we're talking about, well, cars have had free reign in our cities for decades. And when you start talking about inconveniencing them, uh, to a lot of people, it feels like oppression and, and that you're treading on their rights and, and freedoms. Uh, and they will react in very uh, irrational and angry ways. And and uh, but the important thing to do is put that uh, what is generally a vocal minority into context and understand again they're not representative of the larger city. Poll after poll shows that sixty to seventy percent of most cities uh, would cycle more, would love to cycle more, uh, would love to have a safe space for their kids to to get to school in the morning. They're just not out there writing letters to the editor or uh, lobbying their politicians on social media. So we have to support the politicians, help them understand that this is actually a vote winner. Uh, as mm -hmm. and Hidalgo has proved in Paris, Sadiq Khan in London. Uh, yeah, human friendly mayors uh, and, and councillors generally win votes, and uh, but they have to put up with some pretty horrible uh, <laughs> Uh, conditions, uh, growing pains, if you will, short-term pain for long-term gain. Well, I was going to move into that discussion around bike culture because, you know, just work, well, I've worked out of London as well and, you know, particularly similar to to Australia, the, the bike culture, well, the, the sharing of the road concept hasn't quite landed <laughs> from my experiences as a cyclist in Sydney. Um, you know, I guess it gets it gets worse before it gets better. And as you, as you said, you know, if there's any inconvenience to the driver, they they tend to take that personally. And then you have incidences between bikes and roads. And but obviously, uh, though you don't have that issue in Netherlands, where we were just talking before we went on air that you you actually give way to cyclists. Is that right in the Netherlands? So passengers or, or pedestrians give way, cars give way to bikes. Is that is that the correct road rules, or how does it work in in the Netherlands now? Yeah, I don't know so much if it's the the rules, although there is a, a rather strict liability law where if okay. a car hits the, if a driver hits a cyclist, the driver is automatically deemed at fault unless they can prove otherwise. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, it's more just the culture that's built around the infrastructure because ninety plus percent of the population rides a bike at least once a week. They can empathize with that person on a bike that's uh, in front of them uh and so you just yeah end up with this culture where uh the cars the the drivers know that they're guests within the city uh, and they need to behave accordingly and uh you know they're gonna get where they're going uh whether it takes a little bit longer or not there's a, a, mm. a patience built in because the streets are slower there's more traffic coming there's more well, the traffic is circulated away from the the local streets onto specifically onto distributor roads to get uh, the car drivers uh, off of these local streets, uh, and largely the infrastructure is designed to remove this conflict. Uh, you know, the the cycling network and the car network are unraveled from each other as much as possible, uh, and and designed as two separate entities. And those conflict points are carefully designed through. Uh, intersections, protected intersections, protected roundabouts, and engineering mm -hmm. measures that can, uh, well, force the driver to slow down, pay attention, uh, and raise everybody's awareness so that they have to cooperate with each other rather than uh, see it as a competition where everybody's racing to get from A to B as quickly as possible. Yeah, no, you're right. And I think you mentioned something important about the behavior change or the behavior uh, towards cycling or cyclists. And something here that we're facing quite a bit what to uh, I guess what do you think from I guess your role or your current experience um what campaigns or what could we do to advocate more for behavior change because I think that's a critical piece as well not just building it building it's one very important piece but the behavior change or the camp or the advocacy advocacy as well as the political courage political leadership 
to support that. But from a behavior perspective, what do you see is needed? Um, advertising, communications, marketing, the like, there's a lot that could be done. Yeah, I, I think here in the Netherlands and in a growing number of places, it starts with the children. Uh, kids, mm. uh, well, for the first 16, 18 years of our lives, we don't have a driver's license. And so the bicycle becomes our, that initial form of, of freedom. And uh, here in the Netherlands, uh, well, teenagers cycle more than any other age group, which is almost 60% of all journeys, uh, but they uh, undergo traffic education and a cycling exam their last year of elementary school. So it's built into the education system here. And it's assumed that you will ride a bike when they go on field trips to other parts of the city, the entire class. I just saw one out, out my window as we were talking an entire class cycles together to the swimming pool or you know wherever location they're going uh, elsewhere in the city so if we can get uh, yeah get children thinking about the bike as get an option early. get them early exactly mm. teach them the skills they need to navigate the city um those are skills that hopefully will continue on into into uh, adulthood but um it does require infrastructure because uh, if if uh, at some point they will stop cycling if it if it becomes uh, unsafe or uncomfortable, mm. um, driver education I think is also another important uh, part of the the puzzle. Um, the driver's license here in the Netherlands is quite difficult to get. It requires uh, dozens of hours of in class and in car learning, uh, and and obviously the the awareness of people on bikes around you is is drilled into you from a, a very early age. Um, and that they do have the right of way in a lot of situations where the road markings and the infrastructure is designed as such. So uh, I think it's, it starts with kind of formal education of uh, people on bikes and people in cars. Uh, and then there are little things we can do to, to nudge people, uh, yeah, to, to make their choices differently. But I think that latent demand is there, that pent up demand. And mm -hmm. we saw it during the pandemic when uh, a lot of cars were stripped from the streets. People got out there and they were using their streets and walking and cycling and jogging and roller skating and skateboarding. Uh, and uh, when the cars came back, those people disappeared again. So mm -hmm. um, I think in this case, the, the politicians, the decision makers have to, they're behind the population. The population's out there and want, uh, want this. Uh, we just need to to convince the leadership that this is uh, yeah a risk worth taking and a, a controversy worth leaning in, into. Yeah, great. And great you mentioned the word COVID because I want to get into that one. Because you, I think, moved to the Netherlands just before in 2019. So my question was, how was COVID? I guess, how was, was it any different in 2020? Yeah. Since everyone's yeah. already cycling and, walk, and walking around. How was, how was yeah. that experience? Yeah, it's uh, really fascinating because um, well, the European Cyclist Federation kept track as soon as uh, COVID hit of uh, pop-up bike lanes that were built uh, across Europe, uh, and it was the number was quite staggering. By the uh, after eighteen months, it was two thousand seven hundred kilometers across the continent that had been built, and they tracked them by city or country. And the interesting thing wow. was the the Netherlands was at the very bottom of the list. They built virtually nothing during the pandemic but the uh you know and that seems surprising to a lot of people but i think uh when you consider they've actually built a lot of this infrastructure reallocated a lot of this space uh decades earlier they didn't yeah. have to make those tweaks to their streets to give people an option and the advice from the government immediately was uh well during lockdown it was you know get outside uh where you can get some exercise get some social contact access nature this is all good for our mental health when we're locked into our locked in our homes for uh countless hours a day and that's exactly what uh we were able to do and then as cities came out of lockdown it was well you know every seat on a bus tram or train is quite precious so if you can cycle uh 10 15 kilometers or e-cycle uh please do so and save that that seat for somebody who needs it so it really, I think COVID, yeah, asked a lot of questions of our cities about their the resilience of our transport systems, which is why cities really scrambled to build pop-up infrastructure. And what we're seeing now is a lot of that temporary infrastructure is being made permanent. But uh, we always said, you know, if you have to be locked down for two years, the Netherlands was a pretty good place to do so because 
uh, when we needed a break away from our desk or away from the stresses of uh, you know, endless Zoom meetings, we could get outside and we'd be in the polders or in the forests uh, on our bike having, uh, well, what the Dutch refer to as a wind bath, uh, a, a mental uh, restoration, uh, unplug from the, the daily stresses on the, the cycling infrastructure. So uh, mm. I can't imagine, yeah, being, being locked down in a place that didn't have that space because uh, you, you're going out of your uh, lockdown condition straight onto uh, a busy street jammed with cars or whatever, you don't really get that mental break that 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 we needed throughout uh, the COVID pandemic. Yeah. And it's funny you mentioned the mental health benefits because I thought I had coined that, that you know, no one else had captured those. And because I was thinking when I started reading these business cases and then seeing that I want to actually mention the health, the mental health benefits associated with, with active transport, as well, I was not the first one to actually think about it because it is true. Um, and it's funny, it's intangible. But how do you calculate it? So my question is, how do you measure or how do you think we should be measuring the benefits that we keep keep getting asked by government to quantify, you know, benefit yeah. cost ratios? How do you return on the investment when the benefits are clear? Yet there, I wouldn't say hurdles, but certain pieces that are in the way, I guess, or items in the way, which sometimes cause this inertia as well in our leaders. You know, they are get so torn behind this, you know, this figure that has to be greater than one for the investment to occur. Uh, I guess, what, what do you think is uh, the approach that should be taken? Yeah, it's a, it's a fantastic question. And I think uh, part of the problem, it's not just the, the political uh, stalemate. It, it, it's this um, paradigm that walking and cycling is a luxury and an expense that we can't afford um, because we, we see, see it in black and white rather than seeing transportation as an investment. And when you look at car-based infrastructure, it's a terrible investment. It costs us you know, far more money to maintain and, and, uh, uh, and then the, the externalities around pollution and climate and uh, lack of physical activity, is, it's uh, immense. And inversely, when we start doing those social cost-benefit analysis, and this is something that we're, um, we're pushing at the Dutch Cycling Embassy, one of our network participants, the CISIO, they're a consultancy in Amsterdam, They've pioneered this idea of bikeonomics, which is uh, come out of uh, a requirement from the Dutch national government to do a social cost benefit analysis for any infrastructure over a, a, a given uh, dollar amount. Uh, and the, the numbers are quite staggering when you take into consideration uh, a cycling bridge uh, that maybe costs 10 million euros, um, the returns to society in terms of uh, travel, time savings in terms of physical activity, in terms of reduced car congestion, pollution, noise. Um, the numbers are sometimes uh, as much as 30 or 40 euros for every euro invested in terms of the long-term savings to society uh, that come with investing in an active form of transportation, a space efficient form of transportation. And so this idea of bikeonomics has really changed the conversation, not just here in the Netherlands, but the CZO is now consulting in Italy uh, and city, cities across Italy did this cost benefit analysis during the pandemic, where they looked at various scenarios coming out of lockdown, whether they would create space for walking and cycling to capture, uh, well, prevent everybody jumping in their cars because they were scared or uh, of taking the bus, tram or train. Uh, and the numbers were in the billions of euros for, for a few million uh, euros of investment, the long-term savings to society. Uh, were immense. And, and the question became, it wasn't, can we afford to invest in cycling? It was, can we afford not to invest in cycling? Uh, and so we're, we're quite excited about this, uh, this concept. We just had a webinar yesterday with the Irish national government on this topic of economics and social cost benefit analysis. And so we're seeing more and more governments use this method to quantify the impacts and justify them. And, and when you look at it through that lens, yeah, you're you, it's dumb not to uh, to invest in cycling. You're just lighting money on fire as a result. Yeah, it makes and sense. I think we're, and we're taking it here. Yeah, you take you think about as well the assets and and the the infrastructure that, that the cost it takes to just maintain those trains, buses, routes, um, any any heavy roads and bridges require a lot of maintenance. And you think about the cost of a, a bike path and a and a smaller bridge and and the network that it connects because of access. Um, without interrupting the natural space around. I mean, you mentioned, 
you know, just taking your bike ride after having some Zoom fatigue and going to the forest. One of the things I wanted to talk about, I mean, that sounds lovely. We should we should move to the Netherlands, Joseph. I think we'd fit in really well there. Uh, one of the things we were, were thinking is, is around placemaking and how do we make the places more fitting for those bike rides so you're not just looking at, you know, the empty infrastructure that no one's, look, you know, taking anymore. That bike ride is, needs to be a journey as well. And so I think with, in particular, New South Wales, from what I understand, a lot more uh, thought and practice is taken into the urban design of the spaces around where we commute and how we thoughtfully use that infrastructure and also, you know, the rivers and the water spaces um, to make it more pleasant, make it more of a journey. So you can detach from, let's say, work and, and other parts of society that are stressful. Um, where do we go from there? Because obviously building a path is pretty easy. It's not the path necessarily. It's almost like the, the things around it. So that urban design piece, um, how do you talk about um, placemaking when it comes to the, the bike culture from your perspective? Yeah, I think that's when you get into this more holistic approach that the Dutch have around cycling infrastructure and cycling networks. They actually have five key design principles when they're talking about uh, designing cycle paths. And it's the obvious uh, safety, comfort, uh, cohesion, and directness, uh, which we refer more to the route selection than the uh, the cohesiveness of the grid or or the network. But the fifth principle is attractiveness. And I think uh, this is something that's often ignored elsewhere. It's kind of the nice to have. It's not necessarily the most critical part, but it is really taken seriously here. And I think the the choice of routes and uh, are taken into consideration. The access to uh, trees, uh, water, um, the creation of street art. Uh, you know, if you're out in the country, you can uh, usually watch the horses and cows. Uh, I mean, it, it's it's next level infrastructure design because you're not just um, giving piece of, uh, people a place to cycle, you're giving them a really uh, beautiful place to cycle. And, and uh, you know, it's uh, it's hard enough, I think, to make the case for a cycle path to really uh, take the conversation to that level. But um, we, we certainly experienced it firsthand in, in Vancouver, one of the best cycle paths in the world, I think, is the 30 kilometer hours, 30 kilometer long seawall there, which is uh, right on the a car free route on the Pacific Ocean with the North Shore Mountains in the background. Uh, and we'd spend immense amounts of, of time there. So I think, uh, yeah, this is, is certainly uh, a, a contributing factor to people's choices. And uh, if we do want to take cycling seriously, not just as a form of transport, but a form of recreation and and for people to take uh yeah bike rides for um uh, on the evenings weekends maybe even go uh touring mm -hmm. or or on a holiday uh on their bicycle cycle tourism here in the netherlands is a multi-billion euro per year industry um then we do need to talk about this concept of uh, attractiveness and building uh not just comfortable places for people to cycle but beautiful places for people to cycle yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, and we are lucky in Australia, I guess, and in certain parts of it uh, in the city that we do have the landscapes. Again, it's just at the route selection you mentioned. Uh, you, you bring back the things about getting young people back into it, having an education course that's built around um, adopting bikes at an early age, and then obviously building the infrastructure behind that and making the place attractive so that when people do use the pike paths, they have fond memories of it. And what about seasonability? Because I guess with the other the practicality in the back of my mind or the logic is like we've had the worst season this year in terms of rainfall and i know netherlands did i actually think i rode in the netherlands with my kids i had one of them one of those wheelbarrow bikes i had my youngest in the front and i my daughter was in the back and uh it's it just started raining and I, what i looked around and realized everyone else just didn't care there was there was no sense of caring that it was raining it was actually really lovely to ride in the rain with my with my kids and my wife and uh, it was a really great memory, but I looked around and everyone was doing the same thing. Is there a sense of resilience? We just have to, to grow up when we start riding bikes in terms of seasonability, or is there infrastructure as well you put in place to protect? Because obviously Vancouver, I mean, it gets, it gets very, very cold in Vancouver. Um, and they got obviously a network of tunnels, et cetera, when it gets too cold. But what's the, the ideal uh, kind of space? Because you don't want to build a tunnel everywhere you go, because that kind of detracts from your first point or your, your principle around attractiveness. Um, is there a, a balance there? Absolutely, yeah. And I think, um, well, one thing the Netherlands uh, shows, and it's quite a popular saying here, that, that there's no such thing as bad weather, just bad clothing. And you will see 
in 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 the freezing cold winters uh, in 70 kilometer hour headwinds uh, and in 40 plus degree summers uh, um, the cycle paths are just as full uh, because mm. uh, they're a reliable option for people they still have to get where they're going uh, they can just change their clothing and um uh yeah so uh, i think and there's actually been academic research around this is uh, cities with reliable uh, networks of high quality infrastructure the drop off is much less uh than there are in in places where people are rubbing shoulders with uh, cars trucks and and buses I, and i think that's quite obvious when you feel like your life is in danger the last thing you want to do in a driving rain or or uh, a wind is 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 to put yourself in in those conditions but um, every city has its geographic challenges, its hills, its 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 heat, its its cold. Um, but I think there are enough examples now in 2022 of cities that have surmounted those geographic challenges. Vancouver is quite a hilly city, so is Seattle. Um, there are cities in Finland uh, that you know almost within the Arctic Circle where they they have a 30% cycling mode share because they built the infrastructure and most importantly they maintain it. Uh, so that it's usable throughout the winter months, um, and and heat is also you know it, it's I think maybe one of the most uh, the biggest challenges. But it's not to say that there aren't measures that we can take, uh, particularly around providing shade and shade trees. Uh, and it's something they do very well here in the Netherlands is they insist on a certain ratio of tree coverage along a, a lot of the active travel infrastructure because I know it can be up to 10 degrees Celsius cooler at street level uh, when you provide an adequate amount of shading. And then having said all of that, I think the e-bike takes a lot of, all of those excuses away. Uh, and that's perhaps one of the more mm -hmm. exciting things when we're talking about modal shift and its potential to get people out of their cars is the e-bike is now bringing more people into cycling. It's allowing them to cycle further distances. It's allowing them to cycle mm -hmm. up and down hills. It's allowing them to cycle without worrying about sweating necessarily. Uh, so it removes a lot of those uh, uh, excuses to not build the infrastructure um, for, uh, by the way, a, a fraction of the amount of an electric car. Uh, we just need to help governments understand that this is a mode of transport worth subsidizing and incentivizing uh, because right now the electric car is getting all of the attention. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you beat me to the question about the e-bikes, because I think it is a game changer. It doubles your radius of what you can travel. The geography is now no longer an, an issue. Um, so I guess from my perspective, what do we need to do now to rapidly roll out cycleways? What would you kind of give to cities trying to make this change or advise them on, I guess, three, what are three tips? Yes, we understand political, political courage is important, but how do these cities who want to really expand their networks, really get it done quickly and consistently, I guess. What, what do you think are the, the best ways yeah. forward for it? Yeah, um, great question. I think it, it does start, as you said, at the network level. I think we need to stop talking about individual cycle routes um, because we're ripping off the proverbial Band-Aid really slowly, if you will. Yes, right. The, the cities that have achieved the most have designed and built a network in a very short period of time. Calgary, Alberta did it in 18 months, uh, a minimum grid of cycle routes. Uh, and there are more and more examples. Get that network down on paper and get it down on the ground as quickly as possible. Uh, taking into consideration, yeah, the streets that people want to use, the origins and destinations that people want to visit. Uh, and don't give up at the intersection. Make sure you design <laughs> protected, protected infrastructure uh through the corners through the mm. the places where people on bikes are at their most vulnerable uh, because this is unfortunately another area where a lot of cities uh drop off uh, yeah yeah and the network is only as good as as its weakest link as they say mm -hmm. um car management has to be also part of the conversation we can't just build the carrot uh which is the cycling infrastructure we also have to build a stick <laughs> and it sounds uh harsh but it's something I think Dutch cities do really well is um, instead of every street being accessible to every form of motor traffic, uh, as is often the case, they have a very strict hierarchy of streets where local access streets are only accessible to the residents or businesses uh, that live or work along those streets. 
And as I was saying earlier, the, the traffic circulation is specifically designed to push uh, any through traffic away from those sensitive residential and commercial areas onto specific distributor roads. Mm. Uh, and, and this has two uh, benefits. It, it makes cycling more direct and time competitive within the city because drivers have to take a little bit more of a roundabout circuitous route. But it also prevents the rat running that uh, creates those unsafe and uh, uncomfortable uh, mixed traffic conditions on those local streets. And so um, we have to talk about, yeah, the, the carrot and the stick um, if we are going to see modal shift uh, to the scale that we want to see. The third thing I would say is, um, and this is again, something the Netherlands does remarkably well, is capturing the synergy between cycling and public transportation, not seeing these two modes as uh, competitors, but seeing them as allies. Mm. Uh, the cycling here is used as a feeder mode to put people on more passengers on buses, trams, or trains. Uh, because the infrastructure feeds into the stops and stations, because there's free secure bike parking at a lot of the public transport facilities, and because there's a, uh, a rental bike uh, that you can borrow on the other end of your journey to get the same door-to-door -door service after mm -hmm. Uh, over 50, 75, 100 kilometers uh, in distance. Uh, and this is how I get to work every day. My office is in Utrecht, which is 65 kilometers from Delft, uh, is the cycling to Delft station. I get to cycle right into the underground parking facility, uh, park my bike for free, walk straight down the turnstiles onto the platform. There's a train generally waiting there for me. Uh, and then on the other end of my journey, I tap the same public transport card to borrow a bike for 24 hours uh, to get to my office. So, uh, yeah, wow. those are, I think, the big three uh, things that we uh, we work on here mm. at the Dutch Cycling Embassy and try to get other cities to implement uh, as, as, again, uh, as expediently as possible uh, with the understanding that you can't do it overnight, but you shouldn't be doing it in 25 or 30 years either. Absolutely agree. And I like um, the uh, the feeder uh, contribution uh, and, and making them not competing modes of transport, but actually complementary mode. Because that really helps the first and last mile and makes me also think how lazy I was that my commute was only 20k and I would walk and I would drive <laughs> to the station rather than actually cycle to the station. But I have changed uh, is what I'll say, because now my ride is a 10 minute ride to work. Um, yeah. But my other question is, what's um, from another stick perspective, actually, what do you think about the city, I guess it's called the motor vehicle tax or the city tax in terms of where, is that a good, do you think that's a good stick uh, in terms of within a city or is that too harsh? Yeah, I, I, I think um, we get that asked this all the time. Uh, I think, you know, cities like London, Stockholm have implemented a congestion charge where- That's the one, sorry. Uh, can, yeah, can where on. they're charging a, a small fee for cars to enter the city center. There isn't a single Dutch city that that's implemented this. I think they take the next step, which is just banning cars <laughs> uh, from from the center of the city outright. With uh, but it's not car free. I think, uh, and this is an important distinction. They call it auto lou or low car uh, city centers, uh, and uh, which means they're still accessible to residents, to freight trucks, to service vehicles, if they have an appointment and they can book and register their uh, license plate number through an app uh, and uh, there's typically security cameras at the entrances to the city center and if you haven't registered your license plate and and uh, gotten a permit uh, then you get a sent a hefty fine in the mail and that you know makes the city center quite a, a pleasant place to visit uh, there's still mm. car park plenty of car parking on the perimeters of the city centers um, but I, I think you know that's kind of the next level uh, but but a congestion charge is maybe an intermediary step uh, for cities that that uh, don't want to do an outright uh, low car treatment. Um, and, and we're seeing, but again, it's really tricky politically to pull it off. Um, I think the numbers out of Stockholm before they implemented this congestion charge, only 19% were in favor. And so there was mm -hmm. immense controversy, pushback, a media campaign to get it canceled. And then after it was implemented, it was like 75% were in, were in favor uh, because seeing is ultimately believing. But if you're going to spend that political capital on something like that, make sure it's 
it's going to work and that it is, uh, you know, the best possible measure that you can, you can do. Now, New York, Vancouver, other cities are having this conversation, but it's proving to be a very difficult nut to crack politically. Yeah, absolutely. I think Paris is trying to do the same, if I'm not mistaken, in terms of, or Germany, I think banning um, vehicles from the city center. Uh, my next question was about design principles, which is a very big shift. I'm not sure if it's even applicable, but I want to get from your perspective, local streets, you mentioned, um, you know, uh, eradicating rat runs, really designing the streets or designing the air, the neighborhoods for, uh, to enable essentially a natural flow and a natural progression for local streets to enable walking and cycling. From a design principle perspective of a local street, what do you see it, uh, what do you see making it successful? You know, speed zone reductions are one key thing, but what other aspects or what other ingredients do you see building a really great street to enable anyone to ride? Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's uh, it's a tremendous uh, paradigm shift that they, they've done here in the Netherlands is, is um, for a lot of these local access streets, they're designed as places for people to stay rather than pass through. Uh, and it's because 80% um, of, of urban streets here in the Netherlands are uh, these local access streets, which are 30 kilometers an hour or less. Um, but it's not just by throwing up a sign and hoping for the best. I think uh, this is uh, an incredibly important point that typically our instinct is to throw up a 30 kilometer or 40 kilometer an hour limit and then hope for the best, hope that drivers will uh, play nice and hope that the police will go out there and and, and enforce it once in a while uh, to get the behavior you want. And I think one thing that Dutch engineers figured out quite early in this process was you have to design for the behavior you want. You have to engineer the speeds that you want to see into uh, the design of the street. So uh, if you want a drivers to travel 30 kilometers an hour, you have to make it impossible to go faster than that through the use of lane narrowing, uh, chicanes and bulb outs, uh, creating a more serpentine pattern, a change in texture, maybe from asphalt to brick or uh, uh, something similar, uh, speed tables and speed bumps that uh, you know make it a bit uncomfortable to travel faster because you can't enforce and educate your, your way to slower speeds and safer streets. You do have to engineer it as such. And I think the general approach here is if there's too many drivers exceeding the speed limit, then it's an engineering issue and that, that generally the street is redesigned to try and slow the cars down and, and get the behavior you want. So uh, through that, yeah, a lot of these streets are, are quite pleasant places for people to spend time. Uh, you see a lot of benches outside of people's front doors. You see a lot of uh, facade gardens where people have customized the space outside their house with plants and flowers and trees. Um, so the street becomes, yeah, this this communal space where people have a sense of pride, of ownership, uh, and there's social interaction that happens out there versus, uh, well, streets with heavy traffic where people uh, don't want to spend time. They've, they've given up on any sense of ownership of the space outside their, their curb, uh, outside their front door. And, and so this is another impact that heavy traffic has on our communities and on our, uh, well, our, our, ourselves uh, individually. Yeah, I love what you said there. Uh, if if too many drivers are speeding, I just want to repeat that, then it's an engineering issue, which I think, you know, it, just sit with that for a second because usually when we see speeding, we, we blame the individual behind the wheel. Uh, they know the speed limit. But but actually, you're, you're quite right in terms of, uh, from, a, from an understanding of how to build navigation around a city, particularly a city that ha has to be consciously aware of various um, modes of transport, which which obviously can make it a safety hazard for, for a lot of people. But I really love that bit. Listen, I have a question for you. This is, I don't know if you're allowed to answer this, but you know, there's a lot of cities you mentioned and you dropped some names there of, of cities that are moving in the right direction. You know, which city are you most proud of, Chris, in terms of this bike culture? Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's an easy one. Um, and and <laughs> uh, not, not a place that you would immediately think of when you think of uh, Dutch, style, Dutch style cycling infrastructure. I was uh, in Austin, Texas uh, last month, uh, a beautiful uh, city of about 1.2 million people, kind mm -hmm. of a, a progressive oasis in, in, in a, a very red state. 
Um, but they've been working with the Dutch Cycling Embassy for 10 years now on implementing uh, all ages and abilities, cycling infrastructure uh, on their very car dominated uh, American streets. And, and uh, the results have been incredibly inspiring, incredibly impressive. Um, the initial plan, we, we hosted a workshop with them in 2012. Uh, and out of that workshop came a 650 kilometer uh, all ages and abilities network that was going to be built by 2025. Um, and uh, well, interestingly, that that those routes were selected specifically to capture uh, as many short car journeys as possible. So when we talked earlier about this, uh, this three kilometer, uh, uh, well, half of all, all car journeys in most places being under three kilometers, they actually created a heat map of these short car journeys through the use of traffic data. And they were able to plan a cycle network uh, that would capture at least 15 to 20% of those journeys with obvious impacts on health, congestion, uh, pollution, and, and so on. And uh, now 10 years later, we, we revisited Austin with a, uh, a follow-up workshop. We um, got to ride some of this infrastructure, which is beautiful red uh, tinted uh, separated cycle lanes in, in downtown Austin and in some of the surrounding suburbs. Uh, and now with the, uh, they have some uh, bond measures, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars secured to finish off this network. Uh, there's every reason to believe they'll have the full 650 kilometers built by 2025. So uh, yeah, you can, uh, you no longer have to say that we're not Amsterdam. You can maybe use the excuse that we're not Austin. That's fantastic. I wouldn't have thought of Austin, but uh, you know, from a from a small city, but but obviously an ambitious goal to to do the same thing, which is which is great. I want to go back to another word that you mentioned that um, I probably can't spell either. Uh, Bikeonomics. Can you can you break can you, can you break that down? Because I'm sure a few people are listening, thinking exactly what is that? Is that a magic word? Uh, what's involved in bikeonomics from your perspective? Yeah, if you um, if you go on the Dutch Cycling Embassy website, DutchCycling.nl, and just type mm -hmm. economics into the uh, the search engine, um, or maybe we can include it in the show notes. We've developed a lot of different resources on this topic, including an explainer video on our YouTube channel, uh, a two page pamphlet that kind of spells out the various economic benefits of investing in cycling. But it's uh, yeah, it's it's just trying to quantify all those long-term societal benefits that come with getting more people to move more actively in their daily lives. Um, so it, I, I think it reframes cycling as, uh, well, walking and cycling is something that benefits absolutely everybody. Um, whether you ultimately choose to participate or not is, is uh, completely separate because you are saving money in the long-term in terms of reduced healthcare costs, reduced congestion, pollution. Uh, and so on. And so when we start putting those uh, those numbers out there, uh, again, I, as I said, it's it's quite staggering, the return on investment. And if, uh, well, the numbers here in the Netherlands on healthcare alone are that the levels of cycling save the Dutch economy 19 billion euros per year. Uh, wow. That's um, a result of about 500 million, half a billion uh, of annual investment in cycling. So it's almost 40 to one uh, return on, on that investment. And if we were talking about any other kind of city building or infrastructure project, if I offered you a 40 to one return on your investment, you would uh, bite my hand off to take it. And, and yet we're still kind of, um, we're still fight, fighting for space for cycling, but we're, we're optimistic that this is something that's really going to change the conversation. And uh, as I said earlier, cities are uh, shooting themselves in the foot if they don't uh, get on this this uh, this cycling train fairly soon. Well, that brings me to a, a very selfish mode, which is you know the Australian. You mentioned you did some tours. Uh, you probably come to Australia, New Zealand, and you know what's your perspective on on the city layouts in in Australia? Maybe Melbourne, Sydney. Maybe you got to Brisbane. Um, obviously, we, we've got the space, um, and we've we've got beautiful landscapes. Uh, we are moving in that active space now, but you know, what can we do to make things a lot better and maybe move them a bit faster? Yeah, I think there's, uh, it's, well, uh, anywhere you uh, 
start talking about the Netherlands, uh, you're in, immediately dismissed as well. That won't work here. We'll never get uh, 40, 50, 60 percent uh, of our population cycling. And that's that's perfectly fine. And they're probably right, I think, uh, for uh, Australian cities, for American cities, Canadian cities, um, if we could get to 10, 15 percent, uh, that would be a huge win for for all the reasons that we've listed in terms of the benefits that provide so there's an i think needs to be an understanding that we're not going to get everybody on a bicycle for every single journey they take but if we can start looking at these short journeys that people take within their neighborhoods to the corner store to friends houses getting kids to school on bikes getting to mm. the public transport facilities because i think uh, one of our big takeaways in Australia is you generally have pretty good public transport, but there's huge car parking uh, uh, built around them. And uh, but uh, people are driving really short distances to get to the, the public transport. I think in Perth, uh, it was a ridiculous number that we're driving less than a kilometer to get to uh, the mm. regional train regional train network there. So if we uh, start looking at, at cycling and public transport as allies, if we start looking at the short car uh, journeys that are, are taking place within our neighborhood, um, we can we can start making a difference with relatively little money, relatively little uh, uh, commitment. Uh, we just need to, uh, well, take the first step. And, and unfortunately, I think... Um, well, a lot of politicians are, are are quite shy to do so, but we do see uh, the places that are making progress. They do have champions, and and hopefully you can find a champion in in your context that's going to move uh, move the needle a little bit and, and get the ball rolling. Yeah, absolutely. Champions are, as we mentioned, uh, the most vital part. Um, but it also, I guess, from my perspective, what I've seen be a key inhibitor, um, not inhibitor, but in terms of a key uh, I guess a uh, mountain we need to climb or constantly climb, especially in the communications and engagement perspectives, always engaging with the community at the right time to really get those outcomes that they want. Uh, even though we see a lot of potential media, like I said, media revolt, but that could be the voice of a few, not the many, because the many that actually advocate for it or supporting it aren't the ones really ones, you know, barking up against it. So how do you see, or how do you, what do you, um, I guess, would like to in part, or what do you think is the best ethos to really to, deli- to get it delivered? Um, how should engagement be approached? Yeah, I think um, a lot of what cities do, unfortunately, around engagement is uh, is quite broken and, and <laughs> has resulted in a, a broken process, a broken product. Um, we're holding open houses during hours uh, where Families can't necessarily attend, especially uh, mothers. Um, so the only people that you see uh, engaging on these projects are the ones with lots of time, lots of resources, lots of political uh, uh, connections. They're generally uh, quite extreme on one side or the other for or against a project. Uh, and there's this whole section of the population in between that uh, uh, are unplugged for various reasons. They're busy. They, you know. Um, maybe don't necessarily know that they would they would like a, a, a cycle lane in their neighborhood. Um, but if you go out there and you talk to people where they are in their community centers and their schools and the hospitals and so on, uh, and ask the right questions, I think you'll find, uh, as I was saying earlier, quite a, a broad consensus and, and quite a latent demand that exists. Um, but you do have to go to people at times and places that are convenient for them to make sure you're getting all of that middle ground uh, and, and getting their opinions uh, rather than engaging with opposite ends of the spectrum who uh, happen to be lo- out there lobbying for or against a project. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess also the medium that you use is now, I guess, more of a important uh, piece as well, you know, using technology. How, how should we be using technology to support our decision making? It's another key question we, we keep getting is that, you know, data-driven uh, decision-making. Um, however, then you can probably get into a analysis paralysis perspective where you then are in an inertial state as well and actually not delivering anything. So that's a key battle. I see a lot of maybe cities who are on the journey to getting to that point, um, getting stuck in there. So what do you say to those 
uh, cities also who yeah are stuck in a constant data, um, I wouldn't say data craze, but in terms of really wanting to get to the minute uh, detail of the data, because as we know, the benefits are there. So it's mainly finding the routes that are actually, you know, aligned with those five principles to really get, uh, to get it moving. So what are your thoughts on, on that process? And using, yeah, I guess over-utilizing data in some senses. Yeah, no, I definitely think uh, data is important. Um, but if it's at the cost of expediency, then, then again, we're, we're really costing ourselves uh, time and money. And I think at the end of the day, this is infrastructure that saves lives. This is infrastructure that extends lives. Um, if it were any other uh, form of, of intervention in terms of public health or the climate crisis, um, we would have done it already. <laughs> but it is, it is street space, I recognize, is a very uh, polarizing and, and sensitive topic uh, because, again, uh, it's been handed over to one form of transportation for the most part uh, since the Second World War. And, and uh, it, it's quite tough to undo that, uh, uh, unravel that, uh, that car dominance and, and car dependency. But it's just finding the right pressure points. Yeah, I think every elected official, every decision maker, has their own uh, perspective, their own worldview, their own values. And if you can start a conversation that is, uh, if they have children, of course, uh, you know, it's always helpful to talk about uh, kids if they're uh, caught up with budgets and finances, then, then let's bring in the bikeonomics and have a talk about cost benefit analysis. Um, it, it's finding, yeah, the right, I think the right, uh, uh, approach for for the audience that you want to bring along and for the the community it's uh it's storytelling it comes down to storytelling it's not statistics you don't uh fight a culture war with with facts and figures and numbers you present compelling stories emotional uh um yeah uh, ways that people are going to benefit firsthand from the infrastructure you're building uh, share the stories, not the statistics. Is it was our kind of mantra in Vancouver for the longest time, because people aren't moved by by facts or figures anymore. Anyways, yeah, hundred percent, I agree with you. And uh, there are some reasons why I guess there are. Um, I guess job displacements would be one. You know, there is a lot of there's a big industry behind heavy infrastructure and particularly transport. You know, we we do create a lot of jobs, and that's always a good ticket for people who are in roles where uh, they need a vote to be in. And I guess the government is swayed by that politically every every now and then when we have to call for the ballot, which is happening this year in various states of Australia and next year. But um, but I do think the mission and the movement for a, you know, a cycling city is, is fantastic. It's been an absolute pleasure uh, talking to you, Chris, but we moved to our special pop quiz. I did promise you we would have this at the end. Uh, don't worry, it's nothing too personal, hopefully. Uh, just five quick questions um on your own time are you ready to go let's do it all right uh the first one what's your favorite bike oh gosh yeah um well i i've <laughs> really embraced the dutch <laughs> embraced the dutch lifestyle and that includes the the cycling culture uh all four members of our family have a big heavy black upright style uh dutch bicycle with a big plastic crate on the front Nice. Uh, step step through frame yeah uh so it's uh it's all about riding for comfort it's riding for utility uh we're none of us are sports cyclists by any stretch of the imagination so Sounds uh, great. yeah it's it, it's all about utility for us brilliant <laughs> what about uh favorite city and why oh gosh yeah um uh, well I will, uh, I will have to <laughs> confirm my bias and, and say that Delft uh, really has uh, been a dream for us. It, it was kind of an accidental choice. It just so happened that our, both of our employers were located here, Melissa and I, when we, we chose to live here. But at this moment in our lives, uh, we were done living in big cities. Delft is 100,000 people. It has everything we need in a 15 minute walk. It's incredible, walkable, bikeable place and we really do see ourselves uh growing old here yeah we, well, i think we have to visit joseph that's it uh what is one piece of advice you would give to governments keen on considering cycling is a mobility in their in their in their town 
yeah, just do it. <laughs> uh, to quote uh, <laughs> the Nike. Nike. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I think, um, well, it, it comes back to what we we're saying before. Controversy is inevitable. You're going to get backlash. You're going to get uh, hysteria, for lack of a better word. But uh, you, you just have to put that uh, negativity into context, compartmentalize it, focus on uh, bringing people along. Uh, you, you're probably on the right side of history and, and, and going to win votes. Um, mm. so, uh, make it happen and, and, uh, yeah, don't worry about a few angry, negative voices. Yeah. Just get a, um, a bulletproof bike or, or car and you should be fine. <laughs> um, next one, uh, if you could go back in time for one moment in your life, what would it be and why? Yeah, well, I, I think we find ourselves, uh, as quote unquote, Dutch cycling experts uh, talking about this period in the 1970s of immense social change that happened here in the Netherlands. Uh, there was a road safety crisis, a social movement that popped out of that, protests across the country against the uh, um, the automobility, the rising automobility of their cities. At the time, they were demolishing streets, widening uh, streets, uh, demolishing buildings, creating parking, filling in their canals. And there was this immense pushback uh, that was um, compounded by an oil crisis, a uh, six week embargo in 1973. And so we do spend a lot of time writing about that period, uh, talking about that period, but I think it's it would really be something, having seen all the archival footage and, and photographs of uh, what led to the conditions we get to experience today, 50 years later, uh, to actually see it firsthand would be quite special and help us really understand and contextualize it. Yeah, fantastic. And uh, final question, which superpower would you choose to have for one day and why? <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, gosh. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, well, the power to to convince <laughs> the power, uh, the power to just nod uh, and say, "Let's do it," and, and and get everybody on board. Because I think we at the Dutch Cycling Embassy largely spend our time on the how to get it done. Cities decide they want to do this, and then they come to us, and we work quite closely with them on the how. Mm -hmm. um, but we all the time get sucked into the why conversation. It's still, unfortunately, there's case to be made there's still arguments to be had there's still people to convince and if we could just uh, if i could just nod my head and say just do it let's make it happen then we could skip skip to the how and 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 start building infrastructure and getting these measures on the ground instead of standing around arguing about uh well uh busting myths and and having bad faith arguments about people that aren't necessarily that interested in changing their behavior or their city hundred percent. I'm hundred percent behind you. And uh, that's why we had you on the podcast. It was a great conversation. Um, and I believe in building circling cycling cities and they are super important. Um, any final thoughts? I know you've got two books out there as well. Do you want to give a plug? Of course. Yeah. But I, I think um, first and foremost, uh, the one last thing occurred to me that um, and, and uh, your point Val about uh, investing in cars is, is, is quite enticing. I, I I would suggest, perhaps as a closing remark, that it's not either or. Uh, that the Dutch love their cars. Uh, the rate of car ownership here is just the same as most European countries. It's not. Um, they're not building a car for utopia by any stretch of the imagination. Um, the car has its place, uh, and and this is the important. Point that I think uh, the nuance that gets lost in this zero sum game that uh, a great place for cycling can be a great place for driving as well. Uh, Waze has found the Netherlands uh, for three consecutive years the most pleasant place in the world to drive a car, specifically referencing its low levels of traffic congestion. So, um, yeah, mm. there is, if we get uh, the cycling right, then we're freeing up precious road space for people who still want to drive and need to drive. Uh, so we can create these win-win situations where uh, even uh, people will still keep buying cars and st still keep driving cars. We're just giving people choices and, and options uh, rather than uh, 
hitting everyone over the head with a hammer and telling them to get out of their cars. So uh, that's the last point I wanted to make. I'll plug the books, absolutely. Um, Building the Cycling City came out in 2018. Curbing Traffic was the follow-up in 2021. Um, both published by Island Press and can be found wherever you get your books. Um, Melissa and I are also all over social media at Modacity Life, M-O-D-A-C-I-T-Y Life. And uh, also the Dutch Cycling Embassy. Uh, yeah, if you're interested in learning more about the work we do, if you're interested in engaging with us on a study visit to the Netherlands, on a workshop with Dutch experts, on accessing some of the resources that I've mentioned and many more, uh, dutchcycling.nl uh, is our website and we're more than happy to help. Brilliant. Absolutely. And agree with your point. I mean, I think we, someone rode from uh, Perth to Sydney, not that long ago, Joseph, but uh, that was a long ride. Uh, I prefer to drive that by car if I can. Um, but you, you make a great point around, around cycling and we, we do look forward to visiting hopefully Joseph in, in Netherlands at some point. Um, any final thoughts from yourself, Joseph? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, just do it resonates a lot because I think that's my mantra as well to just do it and get it done. Um, Cause yeah, the case has been made, but I think a problem, I guess trying to build a cycling city. Um, I guess the key takeaways for me are um, I think we all need to probably just essentially try to do our part to push and advocate from, I guess, the local community perspective, but also have that champion as a key point. Um, having that network of, I guess, the spinal network to actually get it done rapidly is a key thing. So being fast in your approach to delivery, um, as well as uh, knowing that it's not an overnight change. Uh, I think that's something that people do not. Uh, I guess overestimate or underestimate uh, is that it, they think it'll just change overnight that we are not Amsterdam, but essentially Amsterdam was Amsterdam um, as well back then. So that's a key, that's a key takeaway. And that is, a, and that it is a step change. So I guess, yeah, uh, stay tuned to see what happens to Sydney, I guess, and then you'll be here soon enough to see the, all the great stuff that's happening in Australia as well. But no, thank you for your time. It's been great having the chat now. Brilliant. Well, folks, that's all time we have for. I uh, hope you like what you've heard. You can pay it forward by sharing a link to this episode on your favorite social media. A massive thank you to Chris Bruntlett and uh, thanks for rescheduling, mate. A uh, thank you for listening. Till next time, we say stay safe, be disruptive, and have fun doing it. From me and Joseph, it is bye for now.